Well, thank you very much. Um, an impressive start to the day. Um, thank you very much to the organisers as well for making this event available to talk to investors about Paris and the wider climate investment world and landscape. This panel is picking up the themes that have been introduced to talk about what can investors expect from Paris. And we have uh, an impressive wealth of experience and insight on the table. In fact, I think we were counting it up earlier and probably 100 plus years of engagement in both, and this is the interesting thing, all of the panelists have engagement in both the UNFCCC and climate policy over the last 20 plus years, as well as commercial and, and, tran and transactions experience. So they straddle, if that's not too painful a word, both sides, um, both sides of that. Uh, Paris and the UNFCCC can seem complicated once you peel back the top layer. It can look like, how do you get a deal with 190 plus counterparties? And what we're going to do on the panel is, is open out uh, some of the investment aspects of that, a little bit more detail into what policy aspects of Paris that investors can particularly look at, as well as two of the groundbreaking global initiatives that are being um, executed at the moment around the high carbon end and looking at financial regulation as well. My name's Kirsty Hamilton, I'm an associate fellow at Chatham House and I've had 20 odd years experience in the UN process and I've spent the last decade working with senior energy finance practitioners on the renewables and implementation of solutions end. How do we get policies to do that? Some granularity. To my left is Abid Karmali. He's MD, Managing Director of Climate Finance at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. He's the point person for their $10 billion catalyst finance initiative. He's also private sector advisor to the Green Climate Fund, which is part of the UNFCCC architecture, so we can have questions and, and find out a little bit more about that. To his left, James Cameron. I think of the 100 years of, of experience, James has got about 40. He's actually very young, but he's <laughs> aged badly. Uh, he's chair of... Um, <laughs> He's chair of uh, Overseas Development Institute. He's a former chair and co-founder of Climate Change Capital, and he's had a long and distinguished legal career, including core roles in the UNFCCC right from the outset. To his left, Anthony Hobley. He's chief executive of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Many of you will have heard of that. That's working at the high carbon end. Prior to that, he was... Um, he was a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright and has had multiple years involved in carbon markets and transactions in that area. And to his left, Nick Robbins. He's co-director of UNEPS, um, that's United Nations Environment Programme's inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system. And that's been a pioneering examination of financial regulation in this area. Um, he also was involved prior to that in, the, in heading up the Centre for Climate Change Excellence at HSBC and also head of SRI funds way back uh, for Henderson Global Investors. So let's get going. Abed, um, Bank of America Merrill Lynch have got, made a commitment to mobilise $125 billion in low carbon investments by 2025. Why have you done that? How does climate risk look to a financial institution across the finance sector? And how does Paris fit into that? Sure. Thanks very much, Kirsty, and thank you for the, to the organizers for inviting me to, to be here today. I think there's, there's multi, multiple uh, aspects of that question. You know, first of all, I think we would echo the sentiment that Christiana laid out this morning, which is that it does appear with all this frenzy of activity towards Paris, and what we expect to happen both at Paris and beyond, we have all been given uh, non-exchangeable, non-refundable one-way tickets to a low carbon economy. And for a, a global financial institution like ours, um, that signals both significant opportunity, but also some risks. Uh, and we have to then look at that in the context of uh, our own opportunities and risks, but clearly, the counterparties that we deal with, both on the investor front as well as on the, the corporate front. 
And I think the, the most useful framing that's occurred in the past few weeks has actually been uh, that of uh, Mark Carney in his speech just a few weeks ago, uh, laying it out so clearly as <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the various types of risks that we need to minimize on this journey to the low carbon economy uh, presents, I think, um, uh, a useful framing through which we can then understand in a bit more granularity what specific issues are likely to be material for different parts of the financial ecosystem. So if you recall the three risks he, he mentioned, the, the first is physical risks. Now clearly that's primarily of, of interest to the insurance sector, the reinsurance sector, and we would say generally that is uh, manifesting itself in the markets in some increased appetite from the insurance sector in investing in low carbon uh, energy uh, opportunities. So we see that increased appetite in the renewable energy sector, although I think some in the insurance sector themselves will acknowledge that the, the two different parts of the insurance sector tend to live in a semi-detached house and sometimes the two parts don't uh, coordinate as well. The, the second uh, uh, type of risk is the, the transition risk. Now, for an organization like ourselves, with a significant balance sheet, that is, is why we felt comfortable, Kirsty, in uh, making this commitment at the White House just a few months ago to say, look, we think we can mobilize $125 billion over the next uh, eight years because we've seen an increase in the run rate of all the different businesses that we have focusing on the low carbon economy. So whether it's lending or leasing, uh, capital markets activity, we have the confidence now that there is significant momentum across all those different businesses. Uh, it also presents risks, and I'm sure you know, Anthony will, will mention this. There is this concern that uh, the risk premium for some parts of the fossil fuel sector are not adequately priced. Uh, and that has led to us uh, reducing significantly our exposure to the coal mining sector, in fact, accelerating it uh, towards um, uh, a very low level. And it, it, it's, it's interesting because we now have three times as much exposure as we, uh, to renewables as we do to the coal mining sector, which is quite a remarkable transformation for, let's say, a fairly conservative institution like ourselves. So there are risks for ourselves, both in, you know, in the lending portfolio, but then risks for those investors that are continuing to look at um, uh, index-based investing as being uh, a proxy for uh, you know, uh, what the investment climate should be, uh, even with a two-degree uh, G20 target. Then we have uh, the third category of risks, which is the liability and um, litigation-related risks. Now, I, I found that one the most surprising out of all uh, at, at the FSB meeting a few weeks ago, uh, but the mention was made of tobacco and asbestos as being interesting precedents. Now, that sends alarm bells, I think, to those of us who are um, looking at liability and litigation risks, um, realizing that, in fact, these could be fairly material numbers that provide a, a, a sort of a, a long tail of costs for those who um, may not be uh, may not be disclosing uh, climate risks in a way that they should be, uh, and potentially for investors who may not be incorporating those kinds of risks in a way that they should be. I think all of us would probably agree that the disclosure of climate risks is fairly uh, non-standard, and I think it's also fair to say that the incorporation of those risks by the investment community is, is ad hoc. That's where I'll leave it for now. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I should have explained at start, we're going to do two quick rounds of uh, questions from me to the panellists just to introduce topics and then we'll go straight into as much Q&A as we've got time for it. James, um, Christiana introduced us to the Paris and the Paris context. I wonder if you can um, alert the audience to what you'll be looking out from what you see as the key building blocks from an investor perspective. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for, for putting this event on. And how wonderful to follow Christiana! What um, what a great advocate she is for what needs to be done. So she set it up beautifully. I, I, my sense is that there are a number of standard responses that have to be addressed uh, in Paris. The first is, from the investor point of view, do they really mean it? It's a credibility and confidence test. Are they serious? 
are sufficient numbers of the governments that hold public power committed enough to make changes that alter the flow of capital, make a difference to me when I take this or that investment to my investment committee? The second thing is, are there, is there enough on show in Paris from enough actors, public, private, cities, regions, corporations, is enough that I can see that constitutes my marketplace and is it changing in such a way as I've got to change or I've got to accelerate my deployment of capital in this or that direction? And as ever, and you all know this, all of you will have your own examples, the markets base their decisions on data, rational analytics, and a whole raft of other sentiments. There are loads of followers in the marketplace. There are lots of moods. There are lots of myths. There are lots of reasons to do things that aren't really reasons, they're just what happened today. There's a lot of momentum trading. There's a lot of activity that you can't justify with rational analysis, but it happens. And so the moment that agreement comes together, and it will in one form or another, there are still people holding it up. You still have difficulties that have to be overcome. But I think we can be reasonably confident that there will be a Paris Agreement, it will be pretty substantial, it will be universal, it will have a long-term objective, it will have information gathering mechanisms, it will have a list of instructions to the civil servants of the world of what they're expected to do to meet the long-term objective. It will not contain an allocation of carbon quotas, it will not have a direct top-down limitation on what departments of energy in the world do uh, because of the international agreement. But very quickly after you've accepted it, it isn't of that type, it's not like Kyoto, it's not even really likely to be very much uh, similar to the original framework convention, which of course is still in force for the lawyers in the room. But it will have attached to that superstructure, now as Christiana explained, 155 or more, one hopes by then, programmatic commitments at the national level. And what you'll have to do, if you're trying to test the seriousness of their intent, is to be serious yourself about analyzing those national plans. Look at them from the point of view of what regulatory framework is going to be in place now in five years, in 10 years. What, what political signals it s send to any particular jurisdiction that allows the passing of a particular form of legislation a new incentive for renewables, a new constraint on emissions, something made more granular by a problem with air pollution or access to water, something in, the, in that constituency that matters more right now than general climate uh, policy, but will be a hook upon which uh, the government in question can hang their contribution to the global climate effort. So <clears throat> with that analysis, you should be able to feel the sentiment and the feeling that Christiana identified that this transition is underway. Right? And that matters in markets, the feeling that there is movement and either you're with that movement or you're against it. And you have to have really good reasons to be against it. The second thing I think you will see and it will matter for large capital, there are big institutional investors in the room and people who advise them, is that this is a huge investment space. This is not a quirky, interesting, exciting, green sand pit for a few adventurous people to play in. Right? This is a huge infrastructure, energy. This is a remaking of the economy space for investment. So you have scale. There's no excuse for this is too difficult, too small. It's for someone else. It's a transformational moment and you will be able to feel that, I think, post Paris. I, I don't want to exaggerate what the day will bring because it isn't going to be binary but I do want to emphasize that it will be a significant moment in a transformation that is underway from both a public policy and from an investment point of view. The next observation which matters in, in, in practical politics too, and probably will return to this Kirsty, is that the competitiveness arguments which constantly get in the way of governments doing what is necessary to put a price on carbon or to regulate this or that sector 
or to take away subsidies that shouldn't be there in the first place, or to stop favoring incumbents. The competitors and arguments are going to get increasingly hard to make rationally. When 155 or more governments, including big industrialized nations like China, have their own carbon pricing systems, you can legitimately ask the person that's threatening to leave the jurisdiction so as not to pay for their pollution, where are you going to go? Where is your space in, on the planet where you can pollute freely? Are you going to announce to your workers you're leaving tomorrow, shutting down the plant because you don't want to pay the price for your pollution, but you're going somewhere else where you're free to pollute? Where are you going to go? What's your destination? Very interesting to find out. So I think that competitor's argument is going to shift, and that will be important for investors. It takes away a reason not to. And finally, as has been mentioned already, I, I, I believe that when you've had a look at the text, or ask someone to do it for you, <laughs> and you've had a look at the scene, who's there, what are they saying, are they in my marketplace, are they leaders, would I be more likely to follow that credible leader? You'll come to the conclusion that the risk analysis that you're going to hear a lot about today and the opportunity analysis, which is clearly there in consequence, is going to encourage you to allocate capital, allocate human capital, people, to pay much closer attention to the transformation that is underway in almost every sector of the economy. And it will finish up being a positive agenda. You'll go very quickly from alarm and concern about the science and seriousness of intent from the public policy makers to this is a huge space for me to be an active, positive investor in, and I want to be in it. Thank you very much, James. Uh, Anthony, um, you've been Carbon Tracker Initiative, you've been associated with working at the high carbon end of the, um, of the debate. Can you just lay out the sort of starting points for what, you've tried, what you are aiming to um, bring about and how Paris fits into that? Yes, Kirsty, thank you. I mean, I, I think the role of Carbon Tracker, this strange beast, this sort of former, this, this organization of former financial market professionals, this philanthropically funded group of, you know, former investment bank analysts, is to look at this in a way I, I think nobody else can. I mean, I often think this, this initial piece of analysis that was done by Carbon Tracker, taking the carbon budget, and translating that into something that made sense to ordinary people, and particularly the financial markets, in terms of whatever you think of them or how, how much weight you give to them, but carbon bubble, stranded assets, um, fossil fuel risk premium, you know, orderly versus disorderly transitions, et cetera, um, is critical. And it reminds me of, of that nursery rhyme that we, or you know, story many of us will have heard as, as, as children, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And, and the way I sort of, the analogy for me is, there are all these grown-ups, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and, and, the, and the full world of, of investment bank analysts who didn't do this simple piece of number crunching, even though it was there in front of us. The, the, the huge disconnect between the carbon budget, the approximately 900 gigatons of carbon we can still put into the atmosphere to stay below two degrees, if we put more than 900, then we, we run a huge risk of going above two degrees and, and beyond. Um, and the real world assets, the, the oil, gas, and coal that, that makes up, you know, which will, if burnt, produce a huge amount of the carbon, you know, the, the vast majority of the carbon that's, that's put into the atmosphere. And I asked a question at the, the breakfast we had this morning with Christiana and Mark Carney, you know, why, why is there this myopia in the financial markets? Why did it take this sort of this small group of philanthropically funded financial market professionals to do that analysis? And, and the, the ongoing analysis that Carbon Tracker is, is doing to, to illustrate this issue. Um, and I, I think you, you only have to look at business history, financial market history, to see that those in an existing status quo, in an existing business as usual, almost invariably fail to see the change coming. You know, business history is littered with those names, Kodak, Olivetti, Blockbuster. Um, you know, why are we not streaming our videos from, from Blockbuster? 
why is you know the camera on my iPhone why is that not made by Kodak? You know why has Kodak ceased to exist? Why is your laptop that you're working on there not made by you know the people who manufactured typewriters? Why are the cars that we drive not manufactured by the people who manufactured the, the steam locomotives and the railway locomotives? Because the incumbents almost invariably fail to see the change coming and the transition. And I think as Christiana said at the end of her speech, you know, it is no longer business as usual, it's business as urgent. For me, the transition is happening. It's no longer a question of if, but it is a question of when. So what does Paris have to do with that? So put in my, you know, I try not to be a lawyer these days, but uh, put in my old lawyer's hat on and sort of, you know, the, the amount of international law I had to do in the carbon markets and, and, and sort of climate law back on. I think it, it, any international lawyer will tell you that, that most international law, international treaties, are not about breaking new ground. They're about codifying what the major powers are doing anyway. And I think part of the problem we had in Copenhagen was trying to, to produce an international treaty that took us way beyond what countries were doing anyway in a top-down manner. I think the success of Paris will be very much codifying what is actually happening. And a huge part of that is the technological transition that is now happening. Paris will be about codifying that. And that, I think, is the hope for the incumbents and for you as investors, that it will open a window for you to see the transition that is already taking place. And it will give the incumbents an opportunity to get on the train before it departs the station. And I think it's a big question mark about whether they will or not. I think that's the power of Paris. Paris, as an event, will not be about codifying or putting targets in place that will make us do something we're not already doing. It will be about codifying what we're already doing and perhaps increasing that momentum so we get there in time to save our climate. And I think that, that's the message and that's what investors should be looking for out of Paris. Thank you. Thanks very much. Nick, um, we've talked a bit about pace and scale of action on climate change. You've been working for the last two years looking at financial regulation, You've probably uh, flown around the world a couple of times during that. How, what, what are the key features that you've noticed um, when you've been looking at that? And how do they align with the, what you might see as the more sort of conventional greenhouse gas energy sector approaches that many of us have, have looked at the lens of climate through? Thanks, Kirsty, and thanks very much for inviting me to, to be here. So, uh, as Kirsty said, I, I work with the UNEP inquiry, which is a short-term two-year initiative to really see how the rules of the game that govern the financial system, whether that's in banking or capital markets or insurance or institutional investment, how they can be better aligned with the transition to sustainable development broadly, but obviously in this case we're looking at uh, towards a net zero resilient uh, economy uh, this, uh, this center, century. We've just published our, our report, uh, the financial system we need uh, and there, there, are, there are summaries available and so on um, and in that process we've been guided by many sort of financial leaders, Adair Turner indeed and David Pitt Watson uh, from the UK were on our advisory council, also the CEO of Standard & Poor's, the CEO of CalPERS, uh, Finance Minister of Uganda, etc. Et, et, et and it's great to see so many of the, our partners in the room uh, today. I, I'd just like to sort of maybe touch on sort of four things and then go a little bit of detail. First is that the financial rules are changing, uh, um, that there is a quiet revolution uh, going on in, in the ways in which financial regulators, central banks and standard setters deal with sustainability broadly but also uh, climate change and that's often coming from uh, emerging uh, economies. I think third point is that the sort of Paris moment, the transition uh, that we're seeing, will be networked. It's not just going to come through UNFCCC text, but it's now increasingly going to come through a whole series of other related uh, financial institutions and policy uh, fora. <clears throat> and then I'd just like to touch on sort of maybe what, how the rules of risk uh, might be sort of changing over the next uh, five years or so. so. So in terms of the inquiry and what we found is, is actually whether you call it climate or green or sustainable, um, financial system regulators and central banks and standard setters are now starting to think about this. We've, we've identified more than 100 measures uh, around the world. These are to deal with risk, 
but in many ways, actually, the risk that financial decisions can impose on the environment or the climate. So this is action, for example, that's been taken in Peru or Brazil to make sure that uh, banks are properly managing risk so they don't exacerbate uh, environmental and social externalities. The second is clearly this issue of, of resilience, which I think has been very much uh, the driving force of the PRA's work here in insurance. How do in, uh, the financial sector, financial assets, institutions, as a system as a whole, how do they respond to threats coming at them from, uh, from the environmental agenda, from the climate agenda, whether it's the physical, the transitional, the liability risks. I think the third thing is actually, and this is very much uh, spoken uh, by uh, major emerging econo economies, is actually the whole question of financial innovation, the capital raising dimension. We are here talking about risk. But it's interesting now starting to listen to the IMF. The IMF is now seeing green bonds as tools for, for reducing climate risk. So these two things are, 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 being, uh, are being linked. You can't separate, in a sense, the positive agenda from the, the risk agenda. And then I think there's this question which I think is, is starting, and I think France has very much been the lead, is actually how do you align uh, your financial rules with the transition, with the energy transition? So the new uh, disclosure requirements that are coming through in France and the new uh, requirements for stress testing is, is very much a, sort of a new way of thinking, how do we make sure the financial system is aligned uh, with uh, this, uh, this, tr this transition? The second point is this question, the, 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 the transition will be networked. So I think we all need a, a strong deal, and we will get a strong deal out of Paris through the FCCC. But then now, particularly for the financial community, there are going to be other actors that we're going to need, other international processes we're going to need to be uh, following. Uh, mention has been made of, of the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, and it seems that there will be a um, very, very strong likelihood that a new climate disclosure task force will be launched. Uh, and that will probably be announced at the G20 uh, summit in the middle of November. So in a sense, Paris will already have happened in November because you'll actually have a new uh, body at the international level focusing on this critical issue of, of, of climate disclosure. But it's also going to be other bodies, securities regulators, banking regulators, uh, insurance regulators, pension regulators. All of these are going to need to find their role in dealing with the risks and ensuring that we have uh, an orderly uh, transition. And then maybe just to, to close about how I think this, the, the rules of risk are already changing, but particularly will be focusing on over the next five years. And this will be both uh, a combination of sort of market innovation, but also uh, policy innovation. The first clearly is going to be clarifying responsibility for risk. Uh, this obviously we've been, we've been thinking about a lot in terms of fiduciary duty and there's the great new report from the PRI and UNEPFI on fiduciary duty for the 21st century. But I think working out the, the responsibilities for risk along the investment chain through the financial system, not as asset owners, asset managers, consultants and so on, that's going to be a starting point. Then clearly it's assessing risk and this is where this, this new buzzword of climate stress testing and so on has, has, has come to the fore. How do we bring future uh, environmental shocks, which may not be too far away, into today's decision-making to evaluate the risk to particular assets, but I think probably more importantly, the risk to business models of major uh, financial institutions. The third clearly then is how do you respond to those results? And there, I think, sort of developing decarbonisation plans, two-degree investment plans for, for financial institutions will be important. And there, we already know there are a variety of different strategies that can be taken but I think increasingly uh, clients but also policymakers will be looking to financial institutions to have those plans in place. And finally, there's the reporting, there's the transparency, making sure that the financial, uh, all the, the clients and consumers and beneficiaries understand this, this is transparent. Uh, and so we have a reciprocity, not just that the corporations and assets are disclosing, but also uh, financial institutions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, that's a sort of introductory round. Um, we're now going to do a very rapid second round of questions, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from yourselves. Um, Abed, you're the private sector um, advisor to the Green Climate Fund that's been set up under the UNFCCC. They are going to be looking for private investor involvement. What, in that area, and perhaps in the area of, of public finance, slightly more generally, if we've got time, what, what's the important features to note? Yeah, so, so first of all, uh, if you recall from Copenhagen 2009, the commitment was made uh, to deliver 
$100 billion of, of finance into the emerging markets by 2020. That was the, the goal that was set. And I think all of us in this room realize, per you know, Christiana's comments, it's actually not about the billions, but rather the trillions, the mainstream markets. But look, the $100 billion is, is part of the UN FCCC story. So it's important that there is a credible trajectory. And I actually think OECD uh, published a report right before the, the last uh, World Bank IMF annual meetings that showed that, look, there's $62, $63 billion already uh, flowing north to south, both public and public finance that's catalyzing private finance, that shows that there is a credible trajectory. So I think from a political standpoint, you know, this issue has been neutralized. Um, the Green Climate Fund is where it begins to manifest itself within the, um, the UNFCCC negotiations. And, you know, there it's an interesting story because it's now two and a half years on. Uh, this time next week, I'll, I'll be swapping Guildhall for a meeting room in Zambia uh, for the, uh, the next um, uh, Green Climate Fund board meeting. And, and I'm happy to say that the board is going to be taking up the first investment proposals. So I think it's, it's insightful to look at what's on the table as a guide for the potential for the GCF. And, uh, you know, James referred to the, the INDCs, these national strategies that countries have put forward. Well, the GCF is part of the story to help hopefully lower the cost of capital, reduce the risk, exactly what the investment community wants to see, so that the INDCs, the strategies, can be delivered with a blend of public and private finance. And, uh, some of the opportunities that will be coming up next week include um, a venture fund in, um, in East Africa for off-grid solar. I think that's very exciting. The proposed GCF contribution is, I think, 20 to $25 million of equity, uh, plus some debt, uh, mezzanine debt, presumably. Uh, and then we have a, um, a green bond uh, fund in Latin America, which will promote energy efficiency. And again, you know, energy efficiency is one of the, the, the key areas for improvement that's been identified in the, in the various national strategies. So my, my view is the GCF is well poised, it's well capitalized, $10 billion is the current contribution. The decision-making processes are yet untested, but the flexibility of financial instruments and the flexibility of intermediaries, both public and private, give me comfort at this stage that we'll see GCF being a success story. Thanks. James, it's, it's going to be very quick, but crystal ball time. How are the politics around climate change, which have often seemed sort of intractable, are they going to be influenced, do you think, as technology costs come down, as geopolitics of energy change? You know. Well, there are uh, uh, two factors right there. I mean, most timid politicians will, will want to wait to see who's the likely winner, won't they? They'll wait to see who's going to win in the transition, and they'll follow them. And it's true that as costs come down and as uh, the various people who have the capacity to build clean energy enterprises gain confidence and access to capital, there'll come a point where there, there is a clean energy major around. Uh, there, there is a, a substantial enterprise that can deploy capital in emerging economies for, for renewable energy. And, and these sorts of processes are moving fast now. And, and politicians will shift. You know, those who are currently uh, vested in the incumbency will find it very easy to drop them and move to the, to the, the new guys when they think they're going to win. And this relationship between cost, technological innovation, business development, and politics is an ancient one. I mean, it's nothing new about that. And my sense is that, that, that Paris will help with this process, um, but, but so are all sorts of things that have nothing to do with the process in Paris, but are happening all around it. Uh, and, and the fact that you can win arguments on cost now in so many of the key sectors, access to energy in Africa is a prime example. You can make a development strategy now on the back of solar power and mini grids uh, to, to connect people to an economy in very large numbers, very fast. The speed of deployment is really, really critical in this. And that makes a, a point that's not been present in the politics of international climate over many, many years. It was always assumed that to do the right thing would be expensive. Uh, to require the developing country to do something different from what we did would be in some way a burden. Well, those arguments are going away. And it's really to do 
with very dramatic innovation. And there maybe it's a parting shot because I know we're short of time, we should have questions. But in climate change, we have surely learned now over many years of work that we should not expect a nice, steady, step-by-step, step, gradual change. We have to be prepared for non-linearity. That's what we should have learned from the climate system and all the work that's gone into it. We have surely learned that some of the same characteristics are present in our financial markets. We should be prepared for non-linearity, for shocks, for dramatic losses, for people to be very quick losers. Why should we expect there to be a nice gradual transition if we don't actively prepare for that? And so my sense is that we are going to get big shifts in many key sectors, technological, business model, financial innovations in the finance sector will make some technologies much more attractive and that there will be losers and the losers will be quite visible and they're going to be painful for some jurisdictions, some, some sovereign governments to cope with. But it actually, on the whole, it's what's necessary and it will be broadly positive. Anthony, you're uh, arguably uh, targeting at the losing end, the high carbon end. What, what post Paris, what's, what's next for, where are you looking to land some results? Our work is gonna be very much focused on trying to avoid massive value destruction. The incumbency, as we've heard, you know, has the potential to destroy huge amounts of value as it, if it tries to fight this transition. It can also, as, as Jay, you know, if, if that happens, the incumbency can also take us to a disorderly transition rather than the orderly transition. And, you know, again, going back to all of those, many of those companies who did not make the technological transition, what did they do when they still had the money, the power, and so on? What they tended to do was they'd spend a huge amount of money lobbying to try and, King Canute-like, to try and stop the tide coming in. We saw that in this country and other countries over 100 years ago when the rail and horse and buggy industry, you know, it got Parliament to pass a law such that in this country for 11 years, if you owned an automobile, you had to employ a person with a red flag to walk in front of you to try and delay the advent of the automobile as a, as a challenge to the railroads and to um, the horse and buggy business. You know, we are seeing some of that already. Um, so you, you will have seen, and I, if you have not, please either get a hard copy here or download it, our Lost in Transition report. Our analytical team have started our process for post-Paris where we have looked at and analyzed our all of the demand work that's been carried out by the oil and gas companies, the coal companies, and the IEA. Um, and I think what is shocking is how wrong, how wrong they have got what has actually happened. I mean, I draw you, you know, just to one graph in that report, which is their predictions for solar energy. And when you look at their predictions over the last five years and you look at what has actually happened, it is so wrong, it is shocking. So our work post Paris will be to map out what, what does that road map look like? What is that benchmark for the transition of the fossil fuel industry to a climate secure energy system over the next 20 to 30 years? What is, and I think for investors, for the city of London, for Wall Street, for the financial markets, it'll be what are those safe investment pathways? What and I think for what we, we advocate, engagement by the major financial players, the Black Rocks, um, you know, the Aberdeens, um, the Kalpers Kalsters of this world, what should they be asking the incumbent fossil fuel companies to do in the next five years, in the five years after that, in the 15 years after that? Because if we're honest with ourselves at the moment, we don't have that roadmap, that benchmark that would really make engagement as a, as a powerful counterpoint to the divestment movement, truly effective. So the role for Carbon Tracker, as we go into and beyond Paris, will be creating the hard place to divestment's rock. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Nick, br briefly, financial regulation, is that a, a, the development of that along climate 
risk lines? Is that a slow burn, or do you see certain areas where there's likely to be more rapid movement than people are perhaps anticipating post-Paris? Well, I think it's important to see that the sort of, I suppose the, the transition is not just going to be a sprint to Paris and then it, then it stops. This is very much a, a relay race. And I think at the global level, I think one of the things maybe to, to look out for is um, how China might take forward a broader uh, green finance agenda as part of its presidency uh, of, the, of the G20, something they've been discussing very seriously. And I think they'd like to make, make that broader agenda much more about how you harness uh, capital markets, a key part of their, their presidency. Uh, next year. So I think there'll be a sort of baton passing from, from Paris on the climate sort of framework through to this sort of capital market um, harnessing uh, next year. I think the second thing is maybe then to come down a level uh, into the sort of the rules of the game at the European level. Um, we have a capital markets union uh, process underway. Sustainability, climate and, and green finance was highlighted, but the Commission at this stage decided not to take any action on that. And I think there's, there's, a, there's some uh, a potential really for leading market participants here in the UK, in Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, France, across the Union, to actually say, well, what is a policy agenda that could actually better uh, deploy the, the skills and expertise of Europe's uh, financial system? And then I suppose the last thing I think just to see is, is that there is a, a race that is beginning around financial centres. Which are going to be the financial centres that are going to be the hubs for this uh, transition? And I think it is interesting to see, if you look particularly at the case of the UK, how uh, green finance has been part of the economic and financial dialogue with, with China. And, and, and that, that's a recognition about how the, the China's commitment to this green financial system, how that is playing out in terms of London's role for international finance. So those are three areas. Look at the global, the global baton passing, um, the, the European, and then the financial centre um, race to the top. Thank you very much. Let's um, open out to some questions. I'm going to take, I'm going to take hopefully two lots of three with some very brief answers because we have actually only got under 10 minutes. So I'll go to Paul and then the two gentlemen there and then I'm going to move to the other side. Um, Paul Dickinson, CDP. Um, you know, the great risk is a lack of policy uh, and clarity on policy. That's how we, that's how we get in trouble. Um, John Kerry, a year ago, for those who are in New York, will remember he said that he had 55 votes in the Senate, but he, he, he couldn't pass a carbon tax because coal went on TV in America and scared people. How can investors best be future makers uh, by, by uh, you know, getting, uh, using their authority uh, to stop business, stopping politicians doing their job. Thank you. And then the two gentlemen sort of next to each other, just for convenience. Thanks. The, the coal companies have already been losers. Um, are the oil companies going to be losers, or are the oil companies going to manage to change themselves? Uh, and how much does the role of, invest, of engagement and how much does the role of threatening disinvestment going to play in getting the oil companies to change, or is it too late? Uh, David Nussbaum, WWF. Um, looking at the bridge between this panel and the next, um, what can investors expect from Paris in terms of the cost of capital for fossil fuel companies, whether equity, debt, or weighted average? Uh, how, how will Paris change that, and how would we know whether it has? Thank you. Very good questions. Let's good. take uh, some brief responses to those. Um, one on future makers and policy. Yep. James, you take that, and then we've got coal. Divestment. Oil, divestment, yeah. view, Antony, uh, cost of capital, Nick and Abed, please, briefly. All very good questions, tempting very to answer questions. all of them. <laughs> um, so on investors and lobbying and fear-mongering and communications, one, we ought to know a, lo a whole lot more than we do about where money comes from for lobbying and how much of it is, by definition, shareholders' money, and are the shareholders comfortable that their money is being used in such a way as to increase risk to the rest of their portfolios? Right? It's a simple thing. It's not done, or it's not done enough, and uh, it's about time to really pay attention to this. At the same time, we know, and we had a conversation uh, yesterday that reminded me of it, uh, is that the way 
governments are lobbied by mostly trade associations and business associations is, is remarkably crude. And governments will have meetings with business, tick them off, I've met X business. And there will be a representative from an association. And behind that, there will be someone paying fees to the association. And there's, after that, zero connection between what the person in the room has probably never made a business decision in their lives, has no idea about investment, has held no corporate office of any note, and the company paying the bills doesn't really even care very much and is not associating with what is actually said in the room. But in the end, it's business that's speaking to government and it's written down and notice taken of it. That's just not okay anymore, right? That, that game is just not okay. If you're a serious player in any of these critical markets, and energies will be one, you have got to stop that nonsense from happening. Right? And you've got to stop using shareholder money to get in the way of the development of public goods, the, the communication that's being done on the back of your resources, because it's grossly irresponsible and unfair on the other shareholders. Anthony. No, I mean, I, I, sort of building on that, I think we're seeing a lot of initiatives because of pressure we and others and the investment movement have created, and, and you're seeing the oil and gas industry respond with initiatives like the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, and it is great, you know, to see them, well, I think 10 CEOs of major oil and gas companies step up there, acknowledge the two degrees target, but they need concrete commitments, and certainly one of those concrete commitments should be that they will lobby for the climate policy that we need and their lobbying will be consistent with that. You know, the left hand will not be doing a very different thing to the right hand and I think there's been a lot of that going on. I mean, that is critical. So on, on the lobbying, uh, sorry, on, on the divestment engagement point first, I mean, the divestment movement has been phenomenal. I mean, it has cut through in a way that, that I think nothing has cut through since the anti-apartheid campaigns that I sort of still remember at the, you know, at the back end of those when I was still at university. I mean, Mark, I and others have taken part in debates in a range of universities across the United States, the UK and Europe, and I haven't seen anything engage student bodies, you know, in decades like, like this is. I mean, God knows where these companies are going to get their talent in future, because many of these people are going to think twice, three times before they were going to an oil and gas company as they graduate from university. Um, but let's be honest with ourselves, this is not going to move much of the mainstream finance. So, you know, as I said before, we need a rock, sorry, we need a hard place to divestments rock. We need to set out in a rational way what that transition looks like for the fossil fuel industry over the next three decades. And, and you know, our analytical team is, is, has done a lot of that work. We'll be we laying that out in, in an accessible form as we go through 2016, because I think that is critical. And so that we get the divestment and engagement working together to really move capital at scale. But just on, you know, if you want to understand why this has really engaged so many of, the, of these people, you know, and there's also in the United States and elsewhere many seniors divestment groups, just read Bill McKibben's early piece in the Rolling Stones magazine, you know, Global Warming, Terrify New Math, if you haven't read it already, and the obscure group of analysts he refers to in London, well, that's, that's us, that's Carbon Tracker. Um, but so please do, do read that. Just, just to finish, you know, we, we need to set it out rationally, you know, we do also need to be rational as between oil, gas and coal. We still need to burn, you know, within the 900 gigatons a lot. We need to do it in the most climate and financially sensible way over the next three decades that does not destroy capital. And just to finish, you know, we and everyone in the room, we need to do what we did with the carbon budget, translate the INDCs into something that makes sense to financial market professionals. When they get back to their desks in January, they know what it means for their day-to-day -day work in the financial markets. Cost of capital. Yeah, I want to address the CWAC question, which is David's point, the climate-weighted average cost of capital. Um, and, and I think one of the things perhaps that it, is, is it would be useful for all of us to think about is just take uh, 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 Christiana's um, introduction at the beginning. Which, which scenario are your portfolios positioned for? 
uh, as, at the moment. Are you, are, what's the probability weighting be between the sort of so-called business as usual, four to five degrees, between the desired sort of in, uh, intended uh, just under three degrees, or actually the target of, of two degrees or even even less? Uh, and then I think it'll be a first, and therefore what um, cost are you giving to capital uh, and how are you pricing that into your models and your discount rates and so on? That would be an important point. Um, how would we know whether that's happening? I think we'd know when uh, financial institutions were clear about the shadow price of carb carbon they're using. Uh, that's now being employed by oil and gas companies. We have uh, EIB, for example, using a, using a shadow price of carbon in their assessments. And I think that the more we have uh, the use of that, but also transparency on the shadow price of carbon, which is being used by financial institutions, not just investors, but banks, then would know whether they're on the right track. Thank you. Abbott, yeah, I think essentially the last most word. Of it, but just to add a few things, that, yeah, we may also see risk weightings being used by uh, financial regulators. It, that, that's you know, envisioned within the, the realm of activities that the FSB uh, manages. And you know, we had some discussion around stress testing. And I believe China is already beginning to roll out um, uh, risk weightings for its domestic uh, financial institutions. So that's one indicator. The second is, you know, as part of the, the engineering that's going on, we, we're seeing uh, an attempt to reduce the, the cost of capital for the low-carbon alternatives. And that's why we have all these publicly financed um, you know, green investment banks here or state investment banks in the, in the US. Uh, so we should see more activity on that front to counteract the still significant uh, fossil fuel subsidies that are uh, not exactly helping the equation. Uh, and then, of course, the price of carbon um, should also, you know, we'll see more activity that would, that would uh, again, be an enhancer. Thanks very much. Well, unfortunately, I have run out of time, so I'm really sorry about questions from the side of the, the floor. And we haven't managed to set up a little trading session where I can trade time uh, in for another round from the next panel, although tempting just to borrow from the future, as it might be. Um, I just really want to thank all the panelists. Christiana talked this morning about a ship and a, and a horn. We have tried to be a lighthouse on, on what's coming up. But Paris, to, to really labor this analogy, will be a wave. But there are much bigger deep ocean currents going on from both the low carbon end and rapid price reductions and uptake and system change over their financial system and also pressure pace and scale on the high carbon end. So thank you very much and thank you very much to the panel.